Grace, mercy, and peace to be to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for being a good sport. Get the pun, good sport about the badminton. I appreciate, appreciate that. And um, that's the theme of our service today. To reach the peak, we need boosters. We can only go so high. And to reach our ultimate goal, we need help. So I've used the, um, the imagery of rocket science, of uh, modern rockets. And uh, by the way, our text is the epistle reading, 1 John uh, 3, 1 to 3. I'll be coming to that pretty soon. But modern rockets serve scientific purposes and military purposes and I suggest that this morning they also serve spiritual purposes they suggest a profound spiritual truth which I tried to introduce already with the kids you see rockets go through multiple stages they go through multiple stages there's the initial stage the liftoff stage if you ever watched on TV or had the fortunate Fortune, I guess it's quite an experience to be in Florida, wherever these things take off. And even though you're several miles back, you can hear the thunder and the ground shake and the light and the roar of the, of the initial stage of a lift off of a rocket. When I was researching this a little bit, because this is not my field of expertise, I learned that 80% of a rocket's fuel and energy is spent on liftoff which first surprised me, and then I thought, well, that makes sense because it's at a dead stop and it has to get up. So 80% of its, I've, I've said that, is spent up and just getting it up into the air. And if you transfer that to the human, no wonder we're all tired by the time we're out of the womb and 25 years old, right? We've spent 80% of our, our energy. And that's where I'm gonna go with this sermon that our lives have stages too. That's where the text goes. And then, and then after the liftoff, there's a division. There's a division. One part separates from another part, and it falls away, and it disintegrates, and so the rocket can reach its peak, its apogee. Those are in the old days, when it would just reach a peak, and then uh, uh, it would, uh, when it started coming down, the, it would parachute, and the capsule would come down in the parachute. Remember those days? and it'd fall into the sea and all the Navy ships would be out and they would try to spot it so they could rescue uh, the astronauts, the astronauts. And uh, sometimes they didn't rescue the capsule. One, I re remember, sank into the sea. Okay, but they would get the human cargo. Nowadays, they go into orbit. Not only do we go into orbit, but as you well know, we've gone to the moon and we're gonna go to Mars. And tomorrow we're going to go to Pluto and stuff like that. So these apogees, these peaks, increase in, um, in height and in dimension, taller than the ceiling of the church. So there's another booster which gets the rocket out, in, out into space and into orbit, which is quite high. The Christian life, the Christian life, resembles a multi-phase rocket. There's conception to birth, hmm? conception to birth. You're in a world of your own, you're in the womb. Hmm? We can't think and analyze and evaluate there, but we know if we could, it's a dark place. It's close, it's comfortable, it's comfortable. And then we hear that there's another phase, another stage, and that is a world where there's light, and there are trees, and there's color, and there's movement, and there's space, and there are other people. And, and we hear that way to get that is to be born. It's called birth. So the first phase of our rocket stages, the human existence, is conception to birth. The second is birth to death. And when we get out, we find out it was worth the effort to be born because it's a pretty big and colorful and interesting world. And we hear from either the law of probability or the, the psalmist himself says that we have about three score and ten years to live and walk around and explore and enjoy this world. And if by reason of our strength, right, Psalm 
mm, I want to say 90, huh? if by reason of our staying, four score years. So we have 80 years in this second phase. And a lot of people, here's the tragedy, get stuck there. They get stuck there. They think death is the end, that the second phase, the second stage, the coasting stage is all that there is. But God says otherwise. God says there's a, there's a bigger peak, a higher peak, a more exciting world. And he promises us that in this world. He reveals it to his world. And he says the gateway to that exciting world, what makes this world so exciting? Well, it's eternal. Mm -hmm. It's without sin. I know that's a theological world, but consider the inconvenience, that's a euphemism, that sin brings into your life. Mm -hmm. it's homework. Work Monday through Friday, overtime, illness, hmm? broken relationships, quarreling, earthquakes, disease, and the big one, death. Hmm? But God says, don't put all your marbles into this phase. Don't stick focus. I have a friend, by the way, who does that. I got re in touch with this high school friend because our high school reunion, I won't tell you which number that depresses me, and I uh, might depress you, but it was over Labor Day. And we wrote for months in advance that if you go, I'll go. If I go, you'll go. And so we did that. And we, and we went to the high school reunion and uh, close friend. But I found out something about, his name is Gary as well as mine, that Gary seems to be kind of stuck in this world. He's very preoccupied with his pleasure and his comfort. In fact, I made the mistake of emailing to him the score of the ASU-USC football game. He's a USC fan. And he wasn't upset about the results. He was upset about the fact that he didn't want to be told anything about the game till the game was over. Because many times he has to tape the game. And here I gave him the results of the game. And he gave, my good friend, gave me what for about telling him the details of the game. And he did it twice, so I got the message strong and clear that it's very important to him that he have the comfort of seeing the game and hearing about the game on his own terms. Do you know people like that? They're friendly up to a point. They have these boundaries where my world is about the way I want things. My world is about my comfort and so forth. And God says, don't do that. It's okay to have fun in life. It's okay to joy things, hmm? like food, friends, whatever, all that. Uh -huh. Pick a career that you like. Uh -huh. But don't get stuck with the misconception that phase two is all it's about. Because God says in this text, and now let me read, read you this, this beautiful little text about look for higher heights. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, to you, that we should be called the children of God. Don't you love that? You are called the children of God. Through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the gospel, your heart and soul and mind has heard the good news about Jesus and eternal life, and now you are the children of God. I think about that a lot. Like, why am I so fortunate to be in that status? I, the older I get, the more I credit my parents. My parents brought me to the Lord Jesus, to the Good Shepherd, brought me to the waters of baptism. They imposed baptism on me. I am so thankful they did that. I might not have ever chosen that for myself. And my hunch is that you had good Christian parents too. And you were brought into the family of God, into this status, the children of God from an early age. And then your Sunday school teachers fed you more about Jesus. And your confirmation pastor fed you more about Jesus. And worshiping with your mom and dad and the bigger family of God saw that there are many witnesses about this wonderful promise of eternal life. And the Lord's Supper, now that you can take it, feeds you. And you still come to church to do that. I think of church going as like going to the dry cleaners. Your dress is kind of wrinkled. My suit is kind of sweaty. Huh? I just said that to get your attention. Okay, it's wrinkled. And so I take it to the dry cleaners and get a fresh press. Hmm? I already have the suit, but I need a fresh pass, press. 
You already have the faith. You've had it for years. 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. But you're here because you need a fresh press. And so we exalt in our status of the children of God and we strengthen our faith and our grip. Someone, a lot of people say life is short. Life is short. I don't think life is short. I think life is long. Life is long. So especially in the Christian walk, you need a fresh press. You need a boost. You need a boost to, to make Revelation 2, 10. Be thou faithful until you're 50? No. Be thou faithful until you're 65? No. Be thou faithful until you're 85? No. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Okay, we're in that status, but we're talking about the sealing of the church. And so we are the children of God. The reason why the world does not know us is that they did not know him. I don't think Gary knows, the other Gary knows Jesus. I think he knows Gary pretty well himself and what he likes. Beloved, we are God's children now. Stage two. All right? And what will it be? And what we will be has not yet appeared. Oh, there's a stage three. There's a higher peak. There's an apogee which puts us into orbit. It's called heaven. I inserted that. But we know that when he appears, the Lord Jesus, we shall be like him. And how's the Lord Jesus? He glows. He lives eternally. He's risen from the dead. He lives eternally. He shines with the light of the Father. I still, I think he has. There's biblical evidence. You'll recognize Jesus in heaven because he's the one with the, the holes in his hands and his feet and the impalement mark in his side, okay? He'll glow, but I'll have those marks. Again. That's Jesus. And we shall be like him, like him in this immortality and living forever. It says that. We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies, purifies himself as he is pure. So don't make the mistake that this is all there is. I know you're, I know you're not, but you probably get tired. You probably get tired. Hmm? I don't mean to offend anybody, but Grace Church is kind of an older congregation. A lot of you have been walking on this earth for a long time, and you've been walking with the Lord for a long time. Okay, and you might get discouraged. You might start asking yourselves, I mean, we all have our doubts. It's like, is there really an eternal life? Is there really an eternal life? Is this really true? Does anybody really live forever? Those doubts are kind of natural, but we've got to fight them off. So the way to do it is cling to God's promise that it is true that there is a third stage and a glorious heaven. The thing to do while we're walking is to look forward to the future that's a wonderful future. Gary doesn't have that future unless I misread him. I know it's my job to try to share with him, Gary, there's, there's a new life, a better life. Uh -huh. But you do. So cling to God's wonderful promise. You know, everybody breaks promises except one person. That's God. He not only, he's incapable of breaking promises because God is true to himself. He is incapable of, of reversing the promise of eternal life. Remember that. And take joy in it. you got something to look forward to. And the sermon comes on this particular day, the first Sunday in November, because we remember those who have made it. They were faithful unto death, Dad, hmm? Papa, hmm? other loved ones. They are in heaven enjoying that wonderful life. And you too, we feebly struggle, but they in glory shine. So two, two applications is, remember God's promise. It is true. He is incapable of breaking his promise that there is eternal life for the children of God. And the other is, don't get so wrapped up in this world. Don't get so wrapped up in your comfort, in your pleasure. Now, you need a house, a roof, over your head. You need a car to get around. You need an education. You need food, okay? But you don't have to have the best of everything. The best is yet to come. Hmm? Um, 
you can have a, some nice trips and stuff like that, but you don't immerse yourself in, in making the whole world your playground. You learn to say, and I'm, I know some of you said, you learn to say no sometimes. You learn to say no. I don't need that TV program. Turn it off. I don't need to go to that movie. Turn it off. I don't need to hang out with those heavy drinking friends. Turn it off. Hmm? A quiet, what is the prayer that says that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life? Because this life, it's a good one, it's a long one, will come to an end. But it's not the end. Hmm? We fall asleep and we wake up in the heights, in heaven, eternal life. And those people who are gone before us, they're like a cheerleading squad. They're like a cheerleading squad. Papa's up there. He says, come on, Maida. Hang in there. Come on, Judy. Hang in there. Okay, hey, I'm not far behind you when talking about aging. Come on, Gary. Just a few more years or whatever it is. Stay close. Say no to the world. And you young people, young people, develop good church habits because life is long. And you know that one hour a week won't, it will help you immensely. You're like cheerleaders. In fact, the Lutheran confessions, I got to say this, you don't pray to the saints. You don't pray to the saints. Some churches are big on you pray to the saints. Uh -uh. No, they're praying for you. They're praying for you. They're praying. They're praying, Jesus, Jane's having a tough time down there. She's married to this grouchy old Lutheran pastor. And it's really hard on her. So they're praying to make life easier for her. Mellow him out. You know, they're doing that. They're doing that because they're doing that because they want to see you also at the throne of Jesus. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, the same Jesus whom the saints followed while on earth and now adore in heaven until life everlasting. Amen.